Well, good evening, Seattle, brothers and sisters, comrades. Great to be here, and uh, thank you so much for turning out and uh, supporting alternative radio, independent media, an island of uh, media sanity and an ocean of media corruption. So where to begin? There's so much to talk about, you know, very much like the opening lines of Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, the best of times, the worst of times, the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. Uh, and we are living in an age of fossil foolishness and foolishness as well. One of the things that is so important uh, for institutions of concentrated power, and here I'm quoting uh, Noam Chomsky, is to keep people alone and isolated. That way they're ineffective, they can't defend themselves against indoctrination, they can't even figure out what to think. As long as the general population is passive, apathetic, diverted to consumerism, or hatred of the vulnerable, then the powerful can do as they please. And we are in a culture that, uh, where we are distracted from distraction by distraction. That's a, a line from uh, T.S. Eliot, by the way, from Burnt Offerings. Uh, we ha we're witnessing a kind of a cultural Kardashianation uh, where there's so much focus on trivia and whether, you know, should Ru Russell Wilson have thrown that pass last Sunday that got intercepted? What was he thinking? Why did he do that? You know, if you listen to sports shows, they're quite amazing. I do listen to them from time to time as a form of distraction, but also uh, entertainment and relief from the daily um, grind I have to go through with, you know, so much uh, grief in the world and so much uh, terror and trouble and horror, you hear an enormous amount of uh, analysis, mastery of very obscure information, an incredible uh, sense of fearlessness. You, you hear these people calling up and saying, they should fire that bum. He's no good. He doesn't know how to manage. Uh, that coach shouldn't be paid one cent. Why, or why did they trade for this player over that player? The reason I bring that up, and it was Chomsky that actually mentioned this decades ago, uh, as was mentioned, it was uh, 34 years ago on this day that I launched uh, the first uh, Noam Chomsky program, and I should just tell you as an aside, uh, it was a near disaster because I didn't really know what I was doing, and I didn't realize that radio stations uh, can only broadcast in half hour and one hour blocks. So I put up this two and a half hour uh, Chomsky speech uh, and very few stations took it, but if a few did, particularly the, in the Pacifica network, uh, and that started um, alternative radio. But I had a rather uh, bumpy career, I must say, as a failed sitarist who tried to make a living uh, in New York playing in Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi uh, restaurants. That didn't quite work out for me. And <laughs> Uh, I was very, I was disappointed. I used to sit in the window of these restaurants, you know, and, and uh, play ragas and people would be drinking and eating away and not listening. So it was a bit frustrating. I moved to Boulder, Colorado, my second career, um, after working in the World Trade Center for four years, t uh, teaching English to uh, mostly Japanese and Brazilian business people. Uh, and I moved to Boulder and a community radio station just went on the air and I say, hey, I don't have any job prospects here. Let me volunteer. So I began a program called Ganges to the Nile. Before I knew it, I was on the air first for one hour, then two hours, and then two and a half hours. And uh, I had a particular specialty that was uh, noted at the time. Uh, I would not turn on the microphone, uh, either of the guest or my own microphone. And so people in Boulder, you know, it's a kind of hip, white enclave, very privileged. Uh, they would come up to me and say, is this some kind of Zen exercise where we're supposed to imagine what the answer is or what the question <laughs> is? And I would put, you know, I would erase master tapes. That was another specialty. Uh, instead of fast forwarding, I would rewind and then jam the tapes and then the tapes would break. But ultimately, you know, I figured things out and I got better and better at it. And I launched uh, alternative radio 
on October uh, 22nd. But the role, of course, of the media in shaping opinion and understanding of the world uh, is central to the functioning of a democracy. Um, no less a personage than one of the founding finaglers, Thomas Jefferson, who said that information is the cornerstone of democracy. And if a, if a population does not have access to information, then it can be easily um, manipulated and compromised. I'm often asked about community and how do you build community. And, and, and I hope I'm leaving here tomorrow. Actually, I'm speaking at uh, UW in a class tomorrow and then uh, tomorrow evening at the Zippy Cafe in Everett. Uh, yes, uh, maybe you can make that. That's at, at 5.30. Um, and, and then I'll be going back to uh, Colorado and then back to other places, Kansas City, Vancouver. I'm speaking all over the place. Uh, the orange-haired man is keeping me very, very busy. <laughs> uh, I'll try not to mention uh, his name, but I think you know uh, who I mean. So th the big issue is community, overcoming isolation, because what power wants, you know, what the big boys wants and want, and they're mostly boys, is that you be atomized, that you be uh, cut off, that you be in front of your handheld devices or in front of your, you know, iMacs or tablets or whatever, uh, and not interact with people, not engage. And this is a moment where engagement is absolutely critical. So I created this little ditty, building community. Turn off your TV, stop texting, get off the internet, get out of the house, Drop your tweets and get into the streets. Get off of Facebook and into the face of the powerful because the heat in the streets will melt the creeps in the suites. <laughs> ring the bells that can still ring. Past, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That was Leonard Cohen in his masterwork song, poem, called Anthem. And we have to find uh, those cracks. Uh, Gramsci used to talk about uh, that there is not a monolithic wall here. There is always openings, and we need to find those openings and pour energy uh, into them. And we can take our cue from 16-year-old girls from Sweden who have the courage to stand up to power. I was in um, Vancouver, I mean, multiple times, and uh, there was a, a climate convergence conference at which I spoke, and this was the T-shirt. It says love here with the blue planet. I'm holding this right close to the microphone because this is being uh, recorded for radio. So that our <laughs> And on the back, it says we cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. And if the solutions within this system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. Greta Thunberg, who by herself on Friday mornings uh, in Stockholm uh, took off from school, a school strike, and went to sit in front of the Swedish parliament demanding action on climate disruption. I'll try not to say climate change because when I used it with Ralph Nader, he scolded me. He said, "That's too, it's a euphemism. You have to say climate disruption or climate chaos. It's not just, it's because change is, well, you know, you're changing the part of your hair, you're changing your shirt, you're changing your socks. No, this is an extremely uh, dangerous development that is imperiling the future of the planet. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. used to talk about the fierce urgency of now. These kids are feeling that urgency because it's their future that is at stake. And we are, of whom are, mostly of an older generation, I think we have a responsibility to engage on this issue and to create the possibility of a sane and sustainable future for our children 
and our grandchildren and for the rest of the inhabitants on what Carl Sagan called this incredible blue dot in the universe. Uh, I remember when I was here, it must have been four or five years ago when there was a huge shell rig in, uh, in the harbor here, uh, right off the, the city, and there were kayaks and you know, all kinds of actions, and there was a, a memorable sign once that said, there is no planet B. There is no planet B. This is our home. This is our sacred ground. And you think that would animate uh, a lot of uh, energy to defend one's home planet. But you see the, re the response from the political class has generally been lukewarm at best and indifference uh, at worst. So the time for action is now. And it always takes time in terms of you know, how do movements develop. And Howard Zinn, who knew something about movements and history, he was our great radical historian, he said, it always takes time and persistence. Every movement looks like it's hopeless in the beginning. It seems people have no power, but then people took risks. The most important thing we can do is not to hold back. Resist authority. The more people speak out, it encourages others to do the same. The American system is controlled, but it has little openings. We have to take advantage of those openings. So I hope, after I leave, that you find um, energy, inspiration from the few words I have to say, but that you connect with others here in the community. Because through organization, through solidarity, there is power, and that's how movements grow, paso a paso, step by step, poco a poco, little by little, growing movements to, to stand up for justice and to protect our precious blue dot uh, in the universe. It's going to take a lot of work. The first step, Chomsky says, is to penetrate the clouds of deceit and distortion and learn the truth about the world, then to organize and act to change it. Historical amnesia, he warns, is dangerous not only because it undermines moral and intellectual integrity, but it is the groundwork for future crimes. We live now in a very dangerous moment for all of us, for the country, for the world. But right here in the homeland, right, we have a, a political leadership uh, in Washington which has turned its blind eye to science, uh, refuses to deny the accuracy of report after report, study after study, that climate change, climate disruption is happening because of human activity on Earth, in particular the pumping of endless greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, resulting in uh, the increase in global temperatures. In just a year ago, uh, the IPCC, it's the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, issued a report in which it warned by 2030, now we're 11 years away from that, soon to be 10, uh, by 2030, if we do not hold, hold greenhouse gas emissions and uh, the temperature down to 1.5 degrees centigrade, there will be an enormous number of catastrophes. So time is not on our side, and people like uh, Greta Thunberg and others, Haven Coleman, a 14-year-old in Denver, uh, Alexandria Villasenor, 13 years old, Isra Hirsi, 16 years old, she lives in the Twin Cities, of St. Paul in Minneapolis. She is the daughter of Ilhan Omar, by the way. And uh, she, uh, Gia Bastida, uh, Feliquan Charlemagne, the Sunrise Movement, Extinction Rebellion, 350.org. There are lots of, lots of movements now, lots of organizations, and you saw them on September 20th, and that whole week from the 20th to the 27th, when all 
across the globe, more than seven and a half million people uh, turned out. 300,000 turned out in New York City alone. Probably here uh, in the Seattle area, there was an enormous outpouring of people demonstrating and demanding action, not rhetoric. You know, we hear a lot of rhetoric. Uh, I've been in Canada multiple times, and the Prime Minister there, Justin Trudeau, likes to say he's a, uh, you know, an advocate for uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases, and he's looking to you know, create a sane and sustainable energy. Meanwhile, that's on one hand, and on the other hand, he's pushing forward the Trans Mountain Pipeline, uh, which will have a devastating effect on the global, uh, you know, environmental situation. It will accelerate the uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, in this case, uh, the tar sands from uh, Alberta. And, and in fact, uh, Trudeau uh, was recently again selected uh, to be the uh, pri uh, Prime Minister of, of Canada. And there are other um, women, I just mentioned, these are mostly women involved in the climate movement. Uh, but then you have Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, Ayanna Presley, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. These are incredibly courageous and brilliant women who are speaking up, who are defending our system against the rising autocracy and the notion that a person is above the law as long as his residence is in the, what is alternatively called the oral office or the oval orifice. I don't know which one, uh, which one of those two is, is correct. If you want to do something, here's a, a very practical thing. These women have been vilified to an extent that I dare not describe uh, on radio. If you go online uh, and you see, don't see, uh, I hope you don't go online, but take my word for it. They are subjected to the worst kind of slander and sexual innuendo and patriarchal attitudes toward uh, women. Their lives are being threatened, uh, their faces are photoshopped and then put in extremely uh, compromising uh, situations. Speak out for them. Give them, a, you know, send them an email. Give, call them in, uh, in Washington. And you know, you have people here who are also subject to attack, like Kashama Sawant, like uh, Pramila Jayapal, and other, other people who are standing up for truth and standing up against uh, corporate power, against autocracy, against the drift, uh, dare I use the word, of fascism, yes, there is a whiff of fascism in the, in the air. Some would say it's more than a whiff. It's a stench. And there you have, you know, the, it's very reminiscent of, I've been studying quite a bit of, uh, you know, the history of Germany uh, in the 1920s and, and how that country, which was at the apex of civilization with, you know, incredible architecture that was the rage of the world, the Bauhaus movement with Walter Gro Gropius, uh, literature, Thomas Mann, uh, Fritz Lang in cinema, Bertolt Brecht in poetry, Kurt Weil in um, music. 75% of all scientific papers in the 1920s was written in German. It was, you know, this was not some backwater we were talking about. And in, in 1928, the Nazi party got 2% of the vote. Four years later, they got almost 40%. How did that happen? Well, we can turn to Joseph Goebbels, who was uh, Hitler's uh, minister of propaganda. And he said, the main thing is they are talking about us. It doesn't matter if it's negative. We are generating all the attention. The cameras and the microphones are, and the newspapers and magazines are focusing on us. And you could see that with the narcissistic, narcissistic megalomaniac that is currently occupying uh, the White House, that it's all about him. And the more we focus on him, the actually that empowers him even more. We've got to get beyond uh, just talking about uh, the orange-haired man, but more about what are those things in our political 
culture that he has tapped into so effectively, the patriarchy, the white supremacy, the misogyny, uh, and all the rest. That is something that should concern uh, all of us. And so what happened uh, in the late 20s? You might say, well, it can't happen here. You know, this is the United States uh, of America. Well, you know, Huey Long, uh, the great kingfisher politician from Louisiana who was governor of that state and uh, senator who was assassinated in 1935, he said, when fascism comes to the United States, it'll be wrapped, it'll be a, in a Bible wrapped in an American flag. It's, it's plausible. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I direct you to the uh, wonderful novel by Robert Penn Warren called All the King's Men. Uh, it was originally made into a Hollywood movie in 1949 with Broderick Crawford playing the Huey Long character, uh, Willie Stark. More recently, uh, Sean Penn, uh, did a revival of that movie, but I like the old black and white version. Uh, it's very instructive on how a demagogue, a charismatic leader, is able to sway people and to uh, seduce them. And so what was the technique of the Germans in the 1920s and the 1930s? Simple messages repeated over and over again. Lock her up, build the wall. Drain the swamp. Who will pay? Mexico will pay. And on and on. Make America great again. All of these fascist movements have been also rooted in nostalgia, in the invention of a kind of mystical past where everything was perfect. Uh, blacks and other minorities knew their place. Women knew their place in the kitchen or, you know, in the bedroom. It was a different type of world. All of those movements have depended on and built on an imagined uh, past. And so the constant repetition, this is something that uh, both Hitler and Goebbels talked a lot about. We can c convince people that a circle is a square and a square is a circle. That's something Goebbels said. Hitler said, I can convince people that heaven is hell and hell is heaven. These are just words that can be uh, manipulated. So we have to you know, understand the moment we're in. It's not a moment which uh, you know, we should in any way be fence straddling or you know, indifferent to what is going on. The very future of the country and the planet is at stake. And if you don't think elections matter, they do matter. Uh, and we saw in 2016 where millions of people did not bother to vote. Uh, is, it a, you know, is it a perfect system? Of course not. Are candidates flawed? Of course they are. But this is a particularly dangerous moment uh, in, in the history of the country. And I can only remind you of a couple of names, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh, if you don't think that elections matter, the right wing has been focused laser-like on the Supreme Court, on placing as many uh, right wing justices as they possibly can, and throughout the uh, legal lower courts and higher courts throughout the country in large, large numbers, and they're mostly very young people, not terribly qualified, but who will be sitting on the bench for 20, 30, 40 years. This has been part of a very concerted effort, you know, generated uh, by the right wing, funded by the SCAFEs, the Koch brothers, uh, the Olins, the Stephen Schwartzmans, and all the other gazillionaires that are rigging the system to produce the kinds of outcomes uh, that they want to promote. So we have to work very, very hard to resist. To, or, but resistance has to be in the context of organization. If we don't have organizations, if we, we don't have solidarity, then they can easily pick us off one by one. But if we have the, the uh, different groups, like I mentioned Sunrise and 350.org, which you have here in uh, Seattle, and uh, the uh, Extinction Rebellion, very important that you get involved with them. Now I'm going to read you something else. 
the country we live in. On Tuesday, August 20th at 8 a.m., the FBI came to my door. Agents Carlos Medina, 22630, and Brian Palmer, S04843, their badge numbers, uh, knocked on our door. They wanted to know about my trip to Iran and whether I knew certain people in that country. They wanted me to, quote, share my experiences. We're interested in your story, they said, because the Iranian government targets gullible and naive people to manipulate, imp implying that I am one of those gu gullible and naive people. I said very little. I told them I regarded their visit as a form of harassment. They left after 10 minutes. I kept them on the porch. I didn't allow them in, in my house. But it was enough to scare my wife, Kadriye, who is from Turkey and has knows something about state security police coming to knocking on doors uh, at 8 a.m., 8 p.m., or 2 a.m., or 4 a.m. Uh, initially, though, she thought they were Jehovah Witnesses uh, because, you know, that stereotype, very short hair, uh, very tightly dressed, very anal, you know, uh, well-pressed suits, and, uh, you know, very, very, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, very, very polite. As John Trudell, the great um, American Indian movement activist, poet, songwriter, said, the FBI is the Federal Bureau of Intimidation. And as someone remarked, they should be investigating white supremacist terrorism rather than independent journalists. And I, as a result of this visit, am more energized than ever. And I was reminded of something that the great writer James Baldwin wrote to Angela Davis when she was on the uh, 10 most wanted list of, of the FBI. Uh, he wrote to her, to Sister Angela, if they take you in the morning, they will be coming for us that night. So this is, this is the country that we live in now, where surveillance has become more and more uh, prevalent, uh, where there is an enormous amount of uh, state policing of our comings and goings, where airports are more like scare ports, where I am, have been constantly uh, pulled over and questioned for secondary screening or, you know, for other reasons unbeknownst to me. Maybe it's because I'm so tall and so young looking. You know, who knows what, what they have on their mind. Actually, I've been holding a prop here in my hand and to show you how <laughs> disorganized I am as a double Gemini. Uh, this is an acorn that I picked up in Eugene, Oregon a couple of weeks ago. It was that time of year. And you know, we all want to be giant oaks. We want to be magnificent trees, you know, as we uh, develop. But it takes work to get from this acorn to uh, a, a magnificent oak tree. It takes concerted effort. And so, as you know, as we go through and are inspected by the TSA uh, at the airport, you know, thousands standing around. It's kind of like a jobs program for retired military uh, and others. You know, we have to keep organizing. I'm going to come back to this, you know, over and over again, the centrality of organizing. And it starts, you know, it starts in small groups. Uh, look at the civil rights movement in this country or the anti-Vietnam War movement uh, in this country. Some of you are old enough to remember those days. Handfuls of people. We couldn't get anybody out. You know, I remember, uh, I'm showing my age, in 1964, uh, I was protesting a U.S. military intervention in Vietnam at the Presidio in San Francisco, and we were handing out maps to the very few people that even stopped and uh, wanted to see what we were doing that showed where uh, Vietnam and Indochina was because we live in the United States of uh, geographical illiteracy and uh, largely, uh, you know, as Gore Vidal said, the United States of uh, amnesia. And how, you know, again, social change happens as 
Margaret Mead used to say, it always starts with a small group of dedicated people who work together, find common ground, and that's how social change has always happened. Arundhati Roy, uh, the great Indian uh, writer, social activist, uh, defender of Kashmiri rights, defender of uh, the Dalit, the former untouchables, and other oppressed minorities uh, in India, writes, our strategy must be to isolate the empire's working parts and disable them one by one. No target is too small, she says. No victory is too ins insignificant. The battle to reclaim democracy is going to be a difficult one. Our freedoms were not granted to us by any government. They were wrested from them by us. And once we surrender them, the battle to retrieve them is called a revolution. It is a battle that must range across continents and countries. It must not acknowledge national boundaries. But, Arundhati Roy says, if it is to succeed, it has to begin here in America. The only institution more powerful than the United States government is American civil society. The rest of us, she says, are subjects of slave nations. We are by no means powerless, but you have the power of proximity. You have access to the imperial palace and the emperor's chambers. Empire's conquests are being carried out in your name, and you have the right to refuse. You can refuse to fight, refuse to move those missiles from the warehouse to the dock, Refuse to wave that flag. Refuse the victory parade. You, Arundhati Roy says, have a rich tradition of resistance. And we're not that far from Fort Lewis. We're not far, that far from Bremerton, which, as the bad joke goes, if it were an independent country, it would be the third largest nuclear power in the world after the United States uh, and Russia. You know, we're not that far from the Hanford reactor on Columbia River, which is leaking uh, into the uh, aquifer and into the uh, river. There's all kinds of dangers, not just from climate disruption, but from the dangers of uh, nuclear accidental or inten in uh, intentional uh, nuclear war. Look what's happening in Fukushima. Again, Fukushima coming up because there was a tremendous uh, cyclone which uh, caused massive flooding uh, in Fukushima. Again, you know, imperiling not just the people there, but the flora and fauna everywhere. And of course, our precious oceans which are under attack, which are treated like a dumpster to be, you know, with all kinds of, you know, garbage and uh, contamination uh, material uh, being dumped, dumped into it. You know, it was supposedly Chief Seattle uh, who said, uh, and it's not clear, you know, whether these were actual statements, but it doesn't matter because there's truth there. He said, if you keep if the white man keeps soiling his bed or her bed, uh, he or she will ultimately choke on their own fumes. And then he added, you know, the earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. So coming not too many days after Indigenous Peoples Day, where there was a you know, huge amount of uh, resistance and demonstrations in Denver, which is where the original Columbus Day actually started uh, in, De in Denver, Colorado. Uh, you could see uh, indigenous people with their allies, you know, talking about protecting uh, the earth and injecting one of the great things of the uh, Standing Rock resistance was that people became aware of something called uh, earth protectors and earth and water protectors and earth stewards. Uh, these are important concepts now that have been injected uh, into the public discourse. And even though the Standing Right pipeline was approved uh, by the current regime uh, in Washington, uh, it did inspire a lot of uh, kindred spirits to bond with. Uh, indigenous people and to learn from them and to move forward uh, ensemble, you know, together uh, defending our precious blue dot 
in the universe. And it was you know, such leaders as uh, Russell Means and others who have been talking, uh, who have talked for decades about the need to talk, you know, understand what predatory capitalism is all about, how it is dedicated to maximizing profits no matter what, no matter what the cost is to the environment, no matter what the cost is to future generations. You know, is it in the DNA of this uh, economic system to plunder and to loot and to extract from the earth all of these minerals to generate more and more wealth, at the same time creating an earth which ultimately will be uninhabitable if we continue on the course we are. You know, for many years I was, and others, not just me, you know, we'd be talking about, you know, the Titanic, and we we're all passengers on the Titanic, and you know, there's an iceberg in the offing, you know, coming, very, we're getting very close to it. You can't use that metaphor anymore because the ice caps are melting. So, you know, this, this is a moment of where action is required, not contemplation. Engagement is what is necessary. So whatever you can do, and if all you can do is write a check to support these organizations, that's great. They and we, we need your money, that's great. If you could do more than that, please find a group that you're, you're comfortable with. And this, is, this speaks to something uh, which has, I think, hampered a lot of uh, activists and, and something that uh, Leonard Cohen referred to in that, uh, that little poem I read, you know, that we can, uh, you know, everything is not uh, perfect. There's not a, uh, you know, perfect universe. But wh where can we find common ground? So when you talk to uh, people of the orange, supporters of the orange-haired man, or no, even non-supporters, uh, and you know, trying to find common ground. Do people want to eat nutritious food that is free from additives and GMOs and other, other chemicals like glyphosate? Most parents, I think, would say, yes, I would want my child uh, to have access to good food. How about clean air and clean water? Is that like a left liberal position? I don't think so. How about affordable housing? What a disgrace in this city, and I'm not singling out Seattle, but in cities across the United States, including in Vancouver, where hundreds and hundreds of largely First Nations people are outside in the east end of that uh, you know, city uh, sleeping out. And you, know, you, pant, you pass tent cities uh, everywhere. It's absolutely uh, shocking. And, and when you hear, well, there's no money you know, to uh, help them out. There's no money to build affordable housing units. There's no money to, to provide uh, health care and uh, mental health uh, attention that uh, so many of these people need. Our brothers and sisters, where is the solidarity for them? When they say that there's no money, my blood boils over brothers and sisters, literally blood boils over when I look at the Pentagon budget and say and hear the words, there's no money to help the poor, there's no money for affordable housing, there's no money to protect the environment, there's no money to ensure that Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are fortified and are there for future generations. There's plenty of money, but it's being all wasted in the military industrial complex. They're building F-35 fighter jets. That was from that radical president, remember, Dwight D. Eisenhower? Someone, must, few of you remember him. Republican president, five-star general, leader of the you know, D-Day invasion of uh, Europe, the commander of all allied forces uh, in Europe, two-time Republican president, warned the country uh, as he was leaving uh, in his farewell address, a pity he didn't do a lot while he was president, but in his farewell address, he warned the country about the dangers of a military industrial complex. And in the next paragraph, he said, only an aroused and awakened citizenry can put the brakes on the development of this military industrial complex. If he were alive today, imagine what he would 
say and think about the stranglehold uh, the Pentagon has on uh, spending and on the imagination of uh, most of our rulers and representatives uh, in Washington. I don't need to lecture people here about uh, Boeing. You know all about Boeing. It's in the top five of military contractors. It's, it's kind of, you know, created this image of just building civilian jetliners. It's a major military contractor, as is Northrop Grumman, as is Lockheed Martin, as is Raytheon and United Technologies and General Dynamics and uh, General Electric and all of the other components of the Imperial war machine. F-35 fighter jets, a wing, the wing of them will cost in its lifetime now a trillion and a half dollars. Trillion and a half dollars. That exactly is the amount of student debt in this country. A trillion and a half dollars. We have plenty of money for aircraft carrier battle groups. You can see an aircraft carrier, you know, uh, docked right off the coast here at uh, Everett. Uh, Ford class aircraft carriers coming in at you know, 13, 14 billion dollars a pop, not to mention the destroyers, minesweepers, uh, Trident submarines, you know, at uh, Bremerton, uh, you know, all of these uh, weapons, tons and tons of money going into the Pentagon war machine, and virtually nothing for people the most vulnerable that we should be reaching out for. Instead, they are being uh, degraded, shunned. They have character flaws. It's something in their culture. You know, we, we, we turn our backs on the most vulnerable. We have completely flipped the saying that is on uh, the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, the poem by Emma Lazarus, where she talks about, give me your tired, uh, your, your poor, etc. My parents saw those words uh, in 1921 when they escaped genocide, uh, the Turkish genocide of the Armenians. They came to New York. Those words meant something then. Today, it has been flipped over. There is disdain and hostility generated from the oral or orifice uh, against asylum seekers, against refugees, against uh, immigrants, instead of welcoming uh, the poor and those who are in many instances victims, uh, not just of US foreign policy in Central America and in the Middle East, but also of climate change uh, in Central America where uh, drought and also extreme uh, weather has destroyed crops and the ability of Central Americans to survive. So. People in that situation, they have a couple of choices. They can stay where they are and starve. They can watch their children starve. Or they can, you know, go pal norte, go to the north and perhaps seek a, a better life. So, I, you know, I'd like to see more compassion and openness and where we are a people who can love other people. I know that's a corny word. Maybe I shouldn't use it. It's not very Marxist or political, but it exists. It's real, you know, and we should think about caring and loving and how can we embrace those who are less fortunate than we are. I think it's safe to say that all of you have a roof over your head. You're not going to wonder where you're going to sleep tonight. Uh, you won't be going hungry. But there are millions in New York City, there's 70,000 uh, homeless people, you know, all across the country. Uh, I mentioned that I was in uh, Eugene, Oregon a couple of weeks ago, uh, an indigenous, um, actually it was, she's a Chicana woman, uh, Annette Montero, was sleeping uh, next to a dumpster in a sleeping bag, and she was run over, run over and killed by a garbage truck that was trying to remove the dust of the driver, couldn't see her. Those kinds of things are happening almost on a daily basis because our priorities are so lopsided. You know, our attention is not where it should be on those who are less fortunate. You know, we have the culture of distraction, and so, you know, it's more about, well, the housewives of Malibu, what kinds of parties are they throwing? Uh, what about the Hamptons? Should I buy my $4.5 million house there, or should I wait and, and buy that condo on Park Avenue in New York? You know, these are the concerns of the ruling class. They're not concerned about us, and we should talk about 
a ruling class, as Bernie Sanders talks about a ruling class, an elite group that dominates uh, decision making in this country and prioritizes where the money goes. So when you hear this, you know, there's no money for different human needs, you, again, you know, you should be exploding in anger, but I, I want you to channel that anger into something positive. Rage, you know, that is not focused is really not doing anything. So it's when you find kindred spirits, finding those areas where you can come together and, and have common ground uh, is very, very important. Is, is everyone perfect? Of course not. But we, you know, historically on the left liberal side of the spectrum, can I say that? Uh, you know, we have been, uh, we, collective we, have been, I think, too attentive to the narcissism of small differences. So, you know, this gentleman over here, this gentleman over here drives an SUV. Well, I can't talk to him, he drives an SUV. This person eats meat, well, can't talk to her, she eats meat. You know, this person uh, lives in a high rise, can't talk to him, you know, for whatever reason. You know, and pretty, some, pretty soon, there's no one left to, there's no one left to talk to. It reminds me of that famous poem from Martin Niemöller. You know this man's name. You know his poem because uh, the line, the famous line, first they came for, let me, before I recite that poem in a new version perhaps, uh, I will tell you a little bit about Martin Niemöller because it's very instructive, you know, in terms of resisting uh, totalitarian rule, resisting uh, fascism. He was a U-boat officer in the German Navy in World War I, decorated. Uh, after the war, uh, he became a Lutheran minister. I don't know if it's because of his experiences in the war or whatever. And he became part of the anti-Nazi uh, resistance. And he wrote this famous poem, first they came for the communists and, and the socialists, and I wasn't a communist or a socialist, and I didn't say anything. Uh, then they came for the liberals, and I wasn't a liberal, I didn't say anything. Then they came for the Jews and gypsies, I didn't say anything. You, get the, you got the drift, right? You know this this poem, so I've kind of you know, changed it today. First they came for the Arabs, and I wasn't an Arab, so I didn't say anything. You know, then they came for the Muslims, and I wasn't Muslim, I didn't say anything. And finally, you know, they, I, then they came for the leftists, uh, and I wasn't a leftist. Then they came for the environmentalists, I wasn't an environmentalist. And finally they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up. He paid a price, Martin Neumüller. He was arrested, put into Sachsenhausen and Dachau concentration camps, where he was imprisoned from 1937 to 1945. The only reason the Germans didn't execute him was because he was a war hero. But that wasn't, you know, the Sophie and Hans uh, Scholl, they were not so lucky. They were a couple, brother and sister at the University of Munich, who at the height of Nazi power, 1940, 41, 42. It looked like Germany was going to win the war. Uh, this is before Stalingrad and the great tank battle at uh, Kursk in 1942 and 43. And they were extremely uh, in, oppos in extreme opposition to the uh, Nazi regime. They got hold of a printing press. They started printing some leaflets and flyers uh, against Hitler, calling him, you know, uh, someone who is destroying civilization and you know the enemy and an enemy of decency and all of these things uh, their most famous graffiti at the university of munich where they were students was every th word coming out of hitler's mouth is a lie can you think of a politician today where you might <laughs> apply that to i can't i'm kind of brain dead i can't think of anyone but the washington post owned by a certain gazillionaire that resides in the city, uh, has been conducting a uh, kind of, uh, you call it a scorecard of uh, prevarications, if I could use that word, uh, that have emanated from the uh, White House, and the number uh, just passed 13,000. So in the first thousand days of this presidency, the president has documentably uh, enunciated more than uh, 13,000 lies, fabrications, inventions, calling 
people like me and Glenn Greenwald and Jeremy Scahill and Laura Poitras and other independent journalists as the enemy of the people. The enemy of the people, that's right out of Stalin's mouth. It's right out of Goebbels' mouth. First you demonize a group, and then you attack them. And th that kind of demonization is going on directed toward these uh, brave women that I talked about uh, earlier whose lives I think are in danger uh, because of the venom that has been poured onto them, you know, directed from uh, the White House uh, itself. More than shame. That's why you cannot be neutral at a time like this when there is such, you know, we are in such a critical condition. The kids understand it. The young kids have gotten it. They know what's going on. And they're demanding that we, as mature adults, kick off the rhetoric and move into action, into doing things that will protect the planet and future generations. So it happens because of organization. It happens because people care. And the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerated the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than the democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. O ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or any controlling private power. Now, a great radical said that. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1938, message to Congress. And fascism, you know, it's, it's uh, as Orwell said, you know, it's been used so many times, it's become a term of abuse. But it does have an actual meaning. Uh, and one dictionary uh, definition is, it's a system of government that exercises a dictatorship of the extreme right, typically through the merging of state and business leadership together with belligerent nationalism. So a lot of flag waving is part of that, making a country great again. Its etymology is rather interesting. You know, the first fascist party was founded by Mussolini in Italy in uh, 1915. And it's, uh, the word comes from uh, the Latin. It means a bundle of rods tied around an ax, an ancient Roman symbol of authority. Uh, the point being, if it's a single stick, it's easily broken. But if it's a bunch of sticks tied together, very hard uh, to break them. We are seeing elements of that uh, today, brothers and sisters, uh, comrades. Fascism flourishes in times of economic insecurity and cultural uh, backlash. And you see what happened again going back to the 1920s and 1930s, the constant repetition of simple messages over and over again. How many of you have seen the Lenny Riefenstahl documentary, Triumph of the Will? You can, you can watch it, a handful of hands have gone up. Very much worth your attention, I commend it to you. Uh, she was, uh, it's a black and white film made in 1934 at the Nazi pa uh, Party Congress in Nuremberg the very city where 12 years later uh, German uh, leaders of, of the regime were held accountable for their uh, war crimes, unlike war criminals in this country who walk around you know, and uh, are venerated and respected and treated with dignity, receive $500,000 book contracts, $100,000 speaking fees at our state and, uh, universities, et cetera, et cetera. The Nuremberg rally in 1934, it's in, it's in black and white. She was a, a very creative and innovative uh, filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, a committed Nazi, uh, admired by Hitler and Goebbels, who gave her, you know, whatever she needed uh, in terms of infrastructure. But why I bring that up is that you'll see in these scenes of the adoring crowds in Germany, almost identical, I mean, no things are absolutely parallel, but almost identical to the look on the faces of people at the rallies uh, that the commander-in-chief or the commander-in-tweets 
you know, has in uh, North Carolina or, or in Texas or in Alabama or in Louisiana or in these other, other places where people's eyes are simply glazed over in the presence of the Messiah. It's almost a religious experience where uh, another reality uh, is invented. And it's, it's the kind of thing, you know, the Germans called it uh, Gemeinschaft. It is, um, you're part of something much larger. You know, so if you're, you know, working a nine to five job, you know, driving a truck or pushing papers in some office job, you know, not, you know, terribly uh, engaged, you are given identity in this crowd. You are part of a movement. And that is something that, you know, we can see unfolding that has a lot of uh, resonance with what happened uh, in Germany in the 1920s uh, and uh, 1930s. Uh, it's interesting, again, because we live in the United States of amnesia, uh, when the tweeter-in-chief says, America first, no one points out that America first was, in fact, the name of a neo-Nazi political organization in this country uh, in the 1930s, led by Charles Lindbergh, which filled Madison Square Garden in New York and in other arenas around the country with support uh, for German fascist uh, ideology. Uh, right now in India, you also have the rise of fascism under Modi. You know, these, this is not just limited to the United States. There's Orban in Hungary. There's Duterte in the Philippines. There's Erdogan in Turkey, in multiple countries. There's Kaczynski in uh, Poland. In country after country, right-wing fascist p uh, politicians are coming to power through the ballot box using uh, social media, using Facebook, using great infusions of corporate money that support their ag the political agenda uh, to come to power. So it's not just here in the US. You know, the world's greatest democracy is supposed to be in India. Right now, uh, Kashmiris are under a martial law. It is the most densely militarized zone on the first face of the earth. People have no information or very little information about what's going on in India because India has won the propaganda war in this country. It has convinced people, you know, that everybody's living in ashrams, uh, doing yoga, they're all vegetarians, they're playing ragas on sitar, you know, in this very, you know, very uh, transcendental uh, meditation uh, and the like. It's, it's very, very interesting to, again, to see the effects of uh, propaganda. So, you know, we have to think locally, you know, think globally, uh, act locally, regionally, and, but also know what's going on out there. There are a lot of dangerous trends in this era of decrepit, corrupt neoliberalism uh, that has rendered uh, so many people uh, on the edge and in terms of, uh, you know, economic uh, well-being. You know, we have in this country, not just tremendous uh, deregulation and tax cuts, the imposition of austerity, but something as insane as the electoral college. Uh, interesting, the construction of language. You know, I, I'm a student of Chomsky, so words are, really strike me. What is collegiate? about the electoral college. It suggests that it's a group of professors and they meet and they have faculty meetings and they decide the fate of countries. This is an electoral college. Two of the last five presidential elections were decided by the electoral college. And when I go to other countries, you know, not as developed or sophisticated perhaps as the United States, like Iran, uh, like uh, Jordan, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, Syria, you know, all places I've visited, uh, Pakistan, people ask me, how is it in the United States that one candidate gets fewer votes than the other and loses? In most, in almost every country that I know about in the world, uh, the candidate that gets the most votes wins the election. So we've got to get, r abolish the electoral college. <laughs> And you'd, you'd think that the National Democratic Party, uh, which has lost two of the last five elections because of the Electoral College, uh, would be very, you know, 
exercised about eliminating it, but you know, hardly a word. I think Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are the only ones who have really talked about getting rid of the Electoral College and getting rid of corporate money in politics, getting rid of Citizens United, which has opened the floodgates of uh, corporate money into the political system, getting rid of gerrymandering, which makes it almost impossible for democratic outcomes uh, to happen because of the, the way that these maps are drawn by state uh, legislatures. All of these things inhibit democracy and it's, you know, it's time that we had democracy in the United States, real democracy, not the democracy of $20 bills and tons of money. So I'm going to, um, oh, and, and just to show you the forces that are arrayed against us, uh, this is a full page ad that was taken out in the Wall Street Journal. I'll hold it again close to the microphone so our radio audience can see it. And it is a criticism of Chuck Todd of NBC's Meet the Press from uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Now you should know who they are. This is a, uh, an organization that has ties to the Koch brothers. Uh, it's been part of the tobacco disinformation campaign uh, in years gone by. And it takes Chuck Todd to task for not allowing people who have a different opinion about climate change airtime. So it's a very, this probably costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. So money is still being poured into denying uh, reality. So we have to also pay attention to art, pay attention to cinema, poetry, music, documentary films. As George Bernard Shaw said, without art, the crudeness of reality would make the world unbearable. Emma Goldman, art has the power to make ideas felt. Henry James, art is the shadow of humanity. And it, it's like a, a bouquet, a piece of art you know, if it's a painting, uh, gives you insight into the world, you know, whether it's Georgia O'Keeffe or whether it's Francisco Goya or Pablo Picasso, uh, if it's, you know, the films of uh, Fellini, the great films coming out of Iran, which has one of the most amazing uh, film industries uh, anywhere uh, in the world uh, today. I commend those uh, Iranian films uh, to you. Music, as I said, theater, if you want to understand capitalism, All My Sons by Arthur Miller, Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller, um, you know, all of these things contribute to a greater understanding of our culture and our, our world. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, founder of City Lights Bookstore on in North Beach, on, uh, in North Broadway in San Francisco, who turned in March 100 years old, by the way, <laughs> writes, I'm, signal I'm signaling you through the flames. The North Pole is not where it used to be. Manifest destiny is no longer manifest. Civilization self-destructs. Nemesis is knocking at the door. What are the poets for in such an age? What is the use of poetry? The state of the world calls out for poetry to save it. If you would be a poet, create works capable of answering the challenge of apocalyptic times. Even if this meaning sounds apocalyptic, you are Whitman, you are Poe, you are Mark Twain, you are Emily Dickinson, you are Edna St. Vincent Millay, you are Pablo Neruda, you are an American or a non-American. You can conquer the conquerors with words. Lawrence Ferlinghetti. One of my favorite poets is Marge Piercy. She's contemporary. Uh, on a previous visit, to Seattle, I read her poem from The Moon is Always Female, The Low Road. Uh, this is something she wrote uh, recently. It's called, We Give Up 
far too easily. Why do people get so discouraged about political action? You take vitamin pills and you think they'll do something for you, right? You don't say, I'll never wash the dishes again because they'll just get dirty. We all mumble silly prayers into the air. Oh, please, please, don't let me miss the plane. Oh, please let him call me back. Inaction, that's one word, inaction. Inaction certainly will work fine for the overlords who own our work, control our lives, consider us collateral loss in their grand schemes. Inaction certainly will work fine for the overlords who own our work, control our lives, consider us collateral loss in their grand schemes. They only fear masses in motion. A little at a time is the way forward. An unending dance, two steps forward, one and a half back. Sitting on your ass too long makes you one. Now I'm going to take you to South Asia, where I spent uh, quite a number of years studying uh, music and languages and other things. Um, I'm now banned from the world's largest democracy because of my work uh, in journalism, exposing what the human rights violations of the Indian state that it's carrying out, not just in Kashmir, but in the northeast of the country, in places like Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand that most people you know, haven't even uh, heard about. But this part of the world has a great poetic tradition. Poetry is part of resistance. And the greatest Urdu poet of the 20th century, his name is Faiz Amin Faiz. It's unusual. His first name and last name is the same, F-A-I-Z. Uh, he was born in 1911 in uh, Sialkot, and he died in Punjab, in what was then British India, and uh, he died in 1984 uh, in uh, Lahore. He was a trade unionist and proud of it. Uh, he was a communist and proud of it. Uh, he was uh, sent and uh, to jail multiple times by military dictators in Pakistan, dictators warmly supported by uh, Washington, D.C., incidentally, uh, and uh, an incredible uh, talent. And if you go to demonstrations, not just in Pakistan, but in India, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, you see people at, at these demonstrations ho holding placards up that say the words B-O-L. Bol. It's the imperative to speak in Hindi or Urdu. Bol. Bol ke lab azad hai tere, bol zaban ab tak teri hai. Speak, your lips are free. Speak, your tongue is still yours. This magnificent body is still yours. Speak, your life is still yours. Speak, there is little time. But little though it is, it is enough time. Enough before the body perishes, before the tongue atrophies. Speak, the truth still lives. Say what you have to say. Speak. Your lips are free. Bowl, bowl, bowl. Fez has another poem. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to tell you about it. It's called Hum De Kenge. Uh, it means we will see. We will witness the day. And the famous line in this poem is when those mighty tyrants will be pushed off their thrones and go into the air like puffs of cotton and completely uh, disappear. That's another one of these uh, famous poems from, from Fez Ahmed uh, Fez. And uh, now I'm going to read from Frederick Douglass. Uh, you, some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, according to the great leader in Washington, Frederick Douglass is still alive. Uh, <laughs> pe pe people admire the work he's doing. He's doing a great job, amazing. Uh, you know the extensive vocabulary command of the lexicon that the leader has. Uh, the problem is that Frederick Douglass died about 150 years ago, um, uh, but he was a great um, 
revolutionary. It's interesting that this came up during Black History Month, the shortest month of the year. You know, Angela Davis likes to, likes to say, you know, we even got the shaft on that out of 12 months. <laughs> out of 12 months, they gave, they gave us the shortest one. So it was, I think, the, the last uh, uh, Black History Month that the uh, great leader was praising Frederick Douglass for the amazing job that he was doing. But you may, you may have heard of this before, but no matter, and I have said it countless times, and I never tire of reading this. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom, yet deprecate agitation, are men and women who want crops without plowing, plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without its mighty roar. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. Thank you very much. And we can take a few questions up here. Please come up to the microphone if you have a question. Keep it short and concise. And then afterwards, we will have a birthday celebration. We have carrot cake, cookies, and some vegan, low sugar, raw, and paleo treats. For something for everybody. So does anybody have a question they would like to ask? And some great CDs and books. It's hard to see with the glare. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I, was, I was going to ask a question about there are a lot of people who you were, t you were addressing about how do you get through to people. There are a lot of people who don't necessarily understand what's going on. They don't see what's going on. And how do you bridge those particular scenarios so that you can help them? I mean, yes, we talk about the environment. Yes, we talk about those things, and they're very important. But how do you get through to the even the smaller level so that they can see that this person is lying to them, that people are lying to them, and how things can be made better for them? Well, first of all, thank you for that question. And I think, you know, we have to understand, let's put this in nutritional terms. The diet that the diehard supporters are on is extremely limited in terms of fiber and nutrition. So if your diet consists only of Fox and Tablet and Red State and Infowars and Breitbart News, you're going to have a very uh, limited ability to uh, you know, get the proper nutrition uh, that you need. So a lot of these people, a lot of the supporters of the um, tweeter in chief uh, are kept in these very narrow uh, information uh, silos. So you have to understand that first of all, they're not getting democracy now. They're not listening to alternative radio or to counterspin. They're not reading articles in Mother Jones or in Z or in other progressive magazines. So, you, you know, that's uh, the, the background. Now, in terms of reaching people, you can't be didactic and superior. And I think, I must say, um, we on the left have historically perhaps uh, been guilty of lecturing people you know, and uh, denouncing them for being idiots or morons or not, you know, not understanding, you know, you're not as smart as I am. Uh, this is not a way to win people over. So you've got to be uh, respectful. Uh, you have to also be a good editor. You know, you can keep knocking on the door of someone that you care about and want to persuade. But at some point, if the door doesn't open, you cannot, you have to move on. So it's like, you know, I do a lot of tape editing, audio editing, uh, and, you know, there are lots of things I'd like to keep uh, in a particular program, but, you know, time or, or the content does not uh, allow that uh, to happen. So finding a voice that is compassionate and not uh, didactic or demeaning or uh, denouncing uh, in any way, I think is a way to try and reach people. And 
those questions that I pose rhetorically to you, do you want your children and grandchildren to eat nutritious food? Do you want them to drink clean water? Or do you want them to drink the water in Flint, Michigan, or in Newark, New Jersey, that is contaminated? Because our infrastructure is not being paid attention to, where pipes have you know, rust in them that were built uh, 80, 90, 100 years ago. These are areas, I think, which allow for a certain uh, discussion. Hi, David. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for, your, for a lifetime of great work as an activist. I've uh, looked at you for inspiration and gotten a lot of great information. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, thank I'm you. a volunteer with uh, refusefascism.org. We're a small grassroots nationwide organization, and we actually just had a protest outside Trump Tower with Cornell West. And um, so fascism is one of those things that we obviously study. And it's been said that once fascism is voted into office, you can't vote it out. And I wanted your opinion on that. Do you think that we're too far down the, the path towards this American type of fascism that we're going to be able to get Trump out in, in 2020? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, and, you know, I travel all across the country. Uh, people are energized. People are getting informed. Uh, people are understanding the nature of the crisis that, you know, we face and that the planet faces. And again, I think it's young people that are leading uh, that movement toward the possibility of uh, social change. So this is, a, you know, a very critical election that's coming up. I'm not a huge fan of electoral politics or mm -hmm. the two representative parties that we have, but I think you know this election uh, is extremely uh, critical. And uh, again, if you hear the words coming out of his mouth about the possibility of a coup, about the possibility, you know, I've got the army and the police and the bikers behind me, that's very, very ominous. Uh, extremely uh, threatening. Uh, that's where we are, where this kind of you know rhetoric has been normalized, hate speech mm -hmm. has been normalized. It's you know it's then replicated and refracted in in other media and in other contexts. You know it was easy to be sanctimonious and virtuous about Charlottesville. You know an open demonstration of Nazism. I mean, there's nothing. That's exactly what it was. But there's so many other things uh, that are going on, you know, in terms of uh, policy and, you know, the, as I mentioned, the attack on uh, Mother Nature and, and the environment. So, you know, again, organization is really important and finding common ground, you know, okay, you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, all of our cacas smell one way or another, but we have to find enough, you know, things that bind us together so that we can act uh, and move forward. You know, so I'm optimistic, mm -hmm. but in a Gramscian way. I have pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Pessimism of the intellect, Gramsci said, is you look at the situation objectively. You look at Mitch McConnell. You look at Lindsey Graham. You look at Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch and, you know, the others uh, in, and, you know, Pompeo and all the others uh, that are out there. That's what we're, we're facing. So this isn't a time for magical thinking. This isn't a time for chemtrails or conspiracy theories. It's, you know, so we have that pessimism of the intellect, but as Gramsci said, optimism of the will that we can overcome this. And this was, a, by the way, a very favorite, uh, I must get a plug in for Edward Said that I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight because um, the book I have is Culture and Resistance and the Role of Culture and Politics in, in Resistance. This was his favorite quote, by the way. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. We can overcome these kinds of things. Historically, look at Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Yes, look at her. She's about 200 years old now. Uh, in 1846, in Seneca Falls, New York, she and a handful, not scores, not hundreds, a handful of women started the women's movement in upstate New York. You know, look at Rosa Parks. 
December 1st, 1955, refusing to sit down in the back of the bus, igniting the civil rights movement, the Montgomery bus boycott, King coming from a, a, a church in Atlanta to take up ministry in Montgomery, Alabama. No one could see that coming. This was the third or fourth time that uh, Rosa Parks didn't sit down in the back of the bus, but it was that third or fourth time that ignited this movement that you know, effectively changed uh, and altered juridical apartheid in this country. So you never know where change is going to happen. Can I tell you another story? Are you, you need to get home for the World Series? or No, not necessarily. Let me tell you about a country I know a little bit about, uh, Armenia. I was there in uh, 1917. 1917, that was the revolution. I was there in 2017, uh, and um, I speak some Armenian, so I'm able to get around and talk to people. And I met a lot of, a lot of the young people in particular who were very unhappy with the oligarchic rule in that country. Uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, almost without exception, every single Soviet republic lapsed into uh, an oligarchy. The commissars just, you know, they, they traded their Pierre Cardin suits for Yves Saint Laurent suits or, or whatever type of suits they were wearing. Uh, very corrupt, backroom deals, uh, violent, uh, you know, limiting uh, individual freedoms. The Belarus, uh, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, uh, Azerbaijan, one after the other, lapsed into this corrupt rule. An obscure politician that virtually no one ever heard of, I never heard of him, uh, Nikol Pashinyan, uh, started, a, he was a member of the Armenian parliament, a, a minority party, uh, started a walk across Armenia. Uh, don't be so impressed, this is a very small country. <laughs> But nevertheless, you know, uh, I think very uh, symbolic. And like Gandhi, Gandhi's salt march in 1930, where he went to the ocean, to the Indian Ocean, to collect salt, to defy uh, the British masters who insisted that the Indians pay a salt tax, uh, pay a tax on the use of salt. As he went from village to village, more and more people uh, joined him. Uh, this was shown in the Richard Attenborough film, uh, Gandhi, uh, by the way, where Ben Kingsley uh, plays Gandhi. So Pashinyan did the same thing in Armenia. By the time he got to Yerevan, this is in a country of less than three million people. By the time he got to Yerevan, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the street. The capital completely shut down. The airport was shut. The train stations were shut. The metro did not run. The bus station was, sh was shut. The ministers could not get out of their houses because they were completely surrounded by people power. You know, that, like Saul Alinsky said, that great organizer rules for radicals. You know, they, have, they may have more money than we do, but we have people power. We have the numbers of people on our side. And so this decrepit, oligarchic, corrupt regime completely collapsed, totally unexpected, against all odds, you know, in this tiny uh, republic that is uh, landlocked, uh, that is being, um, you know, heavily uh, extracted by mostly Canadian but also Russian mining companies because it's re very rich in minerals. And the people of that country, maybe like here, want the wealth to go to, to them, want benefits to accrue to them. There are so many other examples like this. I'll just go through them very quickly. What's going on in Hong Kong right now? Absolutely amazing. Almost three months of daily agitation, people in the streets. In Algeria, a decrepit regime was overthrown because more than a million Algerians went into the streets showing that people power works. So there are many good examples. Tunisia is another example. Mohamed Bouazizi was a fruit vendor. He had been insulted, humiliated by government authorities. They were shaking him down for a bribe so that he could continue to sell his fruit uh, in the streets. He refused to pay the bribe. He goes to the government ministries looking for some kind of uh, you know, justice. Got no justice, was, no one would even see him. Uh, he pours gasoline on himself and kills himself commit suicide. That ignited the Tunisian revolution. Within three weeks, three weeks, 
a dictatorship, an entrenched dictatorship of 22 years of Ben Ali that the U.S. supported to the hilt right till the end was toppled. The same thing happened in, uh, in Egypt with, with Mubarak. There are many examples today and historically that we can derive energy from, we can derive sustenance from, and we can understand how movements have changed history. Nothing is written. You know that line in Lawrence of Arabia where uh, uh, Omar Sharif, he plays, Omar Sharif plays an uh, Arab emir. It's, it's a very colonial movie, by the way. I don't recommend that you see it, but I'm reminded of that. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia, played by Peter O'Toole, uh, wants to do something, and Omar Sharif says, it is written, you know, you cannot do this. And Lawrence says, nothing is written. And nothing is written, nothing is foretold, you know. We, we are still out there, people are still struggling for justice, and that is a struggle worth all of our attention. Hi, David. Hello. My name is Nadeem from the largest democracy on the planet, India. And uh, you forgot to mention two things about the Indian export. Yoga can, mats. Can you speak up, please? Can you, you forgot two things to mention about India is yoga mats and chicken tikka masala. <laughs> so I'm not going to. Oh, okay. Uh, my question to you is I know you were barred from uh, after re reporting in Kashmir. And uh, you and I spoke briefly about it earlier with the telephone a few months ago. Um, I'm, just, I'm just curious about the alliances of uh, Israel, U.S., uh, and India in terms of this whole backdoor technologies which has been created uh, for, um, for manufacturing um, elections, uh, manipulations, and all of that, and also um, Modi Trump alliance recently with Trump uh, Modi's coming to the United States in Houston with the Howdy Modi event um, and Trump showing up um, at his event. Um, what is this whole sort of this nexus, this alliances of this uh, uh, Modi Trump and Netanyahu? Thank you. Well, it's, it's rather ironic that India, when it gained independence in 1947, which is when the seeds of the current conflict in uh, Kashmir were planted, because uh, that was an unresolved uh, issue uh, at, the, at that time, that uh, India was, in fact, the champion of liberation movements uh, all across the world, particularly in Palestine. Under Nehru, uh, the independence of uh, Palestine was a very important issue. Uh, it, the UN, time and time again, India supported uh, not just Palestine, but other countries that were throwing off the yoke of European imperialism, the French in Algeria, uh, the Dutch in Indonesia, the Belgians in the Congo, uh, and on, and, and the British practically everywhere else, you know, Tanzania, Kenya, um, uh, etc. That was then. Uh, over the decades, uh, India has moved uh, way to the right. Uh, it elected a prime, it's interesting, elected a prime minister in two, 2014. His name is Modi, M-O-D-I. Uh, he was a former uh, chief minister of the state of Gujarat in western India. It's Gandhi's home state, by the way. Uh, and uh, he presided over a massacre of Muslims in 2002. Uh, well over a thousand, as, up to, as many as uh, 2,000 Muslims were killed in an organized pogrom that had to have a state sanction uh, in, order to it, in order for it to be carried, carried out. Uh, this pogrom was so obnoxious that even the George W. Bush administration banned uh, Modi from visiting uh, the United States. That, of course, changed with the arrival of the orange-haired man uh, in the White House. Uh, Modi's background is red redolent with fascism. Uh, he was a member of the, uh, what is called the RSS, the Rashtriya Sewan Sabak Sang, uh, a right-wing 
military, militaristic organization based on Mussolini and Hitler doctrine, expressing great admiration for fascism. It started in India in 1925, as, as a matter of fact. And we've seen then with the election of Modi in uh, 2019, uh, India has been moving way to the right. Uh, it now has alliances with military alliances with Israel and the United States. Uh, there's been a, a lot of exchange of um, surveillance technology as well as hacking uh, technology. Uh, again, posing, I think, enormous uh, dangers. Uh, you know, in talking about uh, India and talking about uh, Israel, also you see the, uh, the effects of propaganda. A lot of people in this country uh, have not really understood the grievance of the Palestinians and have been uh, subjected largely to a media that has been so, uh, pro, so biased in one direction that they really don't have an understanding of, you know, why are these people so agitated? Well, again, you know, a little history is a dangerous thing. If you understand what's going on in terms of annexation of land, destruction of a million olive trees, the siphoning off of water uh, uh, from the West Bank, which is supposed to be the home of a future Palestinian state, the introduction of 600,000 settlers, they actually should be called colonizers uh, in the West Bank, making the possibility of a viable independent Palestinian state virtually nil. I mean, maybe it'll be like a little Bantustan with a few casinos and uh, air-conditioned malls. That'll be it. Here's your state. Take it or leave it. That's what the policy is leading to. And in some ways, what we have today with the orange-haired man uh, is real clarity. I mean, the U.S. is so one-sided uh, in this uh, conflict in this question of Palestine, that there should be no doubt in anyone's mind anymore, and no one should utter the words honest broker or neutral party or, you know, someone who is in some way objective. Moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in viola violation of uh, international law and UN Security Council resolutions. But when you're a disciple of the master, like the master yourself, you are immune from international law. That is one of the qualities of being, you know, on top of the heap. International law is to be applied to others, to designated enemies, not to yourself and not to your servants. So India is in grotesque violation of international law, not just in Kashmir, but in other parts uh, of, that, of, the, of the subcontinent. But there is no accountability because of this you know, doctrine, as Michael Parenti used to say, we don't make the world safe for democracy, we're making it safe for hypocrisy. So there's, I mean, there's a lot more to say about uh, India, about Israel, about the United States, but they're all moving uh, closer together in concert uh, in ways which I think are extremely dangerous. What Modi has done by annexing Kashmir will sow the seeds of permanent rebellion in the Indian subcontinent. I've been to Kashmir multiple times. I know what those people are thinking about uh, right now. You know, I'm hearing reports from there, getting reports from there as well. And there's going to be permanent rebellion. If they have opened a wound that will not be healed unless there is self-determination for Kashmiris and in the Middle East, unless there is self-determination for the Palestinians. I haven't found anybody to vote for president of character since Jimmy Carter. Of course, we only gave him one term because he told us the truth. And I've always voted my conscience, and I've always tended to be on a third-party ticket. And so this time around, I have to ask people who I have respect for, like yourself, do I just go with the Democratic Party because... I mean, I don't find any character there. I find no substance whatsoever. I don't see any difference between the two parties, myself. And so, do I not vote my conscience? I'm afraid now. Yeah, I get this question a lot. I don't tell people, you know, what to do. Uh, you know, I've expressed my opinion about different things, but, uh, you know, it's, it's something, it's your judgment. You know, you have to feel what is right. And 
and you have to feel authentic in anything you do. You know, so. Are you going to vote Democrat? Sorry? Are you going to vote Democrat? Uh, I'll vote strategically in Colorado, uh, as I did in 2016 and before that. You know, if it's a largely a, a blue state. So the possibility of voting for an independent candidate is, is there for me. So I'm going to wind up now. I hope people are starting to leave. I hope you'll get some books and some CDs. Thanks very much for coming out. Thank you for the...